today. Okay. Um, so some announcements, uh, and then feel free to ask questions um, along the way. A um, couple big things. Well, um, because of that lost week and a half, you know, we, you know, spring break week, and then we lost another week and a half uh, pivoting to online. Um, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to chop off one of the forum posts, right? Um, the, the original syllabus said eight forum posts. It's just not going to be possible for me to just shove in two more forum posts at you because I think that would be, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that would be fair to you guys uh, to, to just, you know, be like, hey, we're going to do two more of these because the syllabus says so, and I'm going by the syllabus. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what we were going to do in forum post seven and eight, and I'm going to smush it into one. All right, uh, for next week. Uh, and so <clears throat> sometime today or tomorrow, I will publish uh, what's going to be our final forum post. What I'm probably going to do is um, I'll add, you know, five or so points onto it uh, just because, it, you know, it, it's going to be a combined, so we're not losing, um, you know, a lot of those points off the back end. So it'll probably be like a 30-point forum post, okay? Um, and it'll cover uh, things from Chapter 14. We're going to look into... Uh, scholasticism, which if you watched the notes yesterday, I kind of started hinting that we were heading into scholasticism and what scholasticism is all about. If you haven't started to read up on scholasticism in chapter 14 and what the definition is, please do. Uh, that's going to be a big part of the class as we finish up is your understanding of scholasticism and what it means and who were the scholastics. Then the second part of the forum post will be going into cathedral building and cathedral construction. And we're going to watch a few secondary sources, uh, video aids on cathedrals, how they were built, what they, you know, what are some of the, the things that went into uh, cathedral building, all that stuff. Okay, so that's going to be the final forum post, um, and you'll have all next week. Like I said, I'll publish it, um, if not today, because I got a lot of stuff to work on with some other classes today after this one, but most definitely tomorrow. And then you'll have basically Friday, uh, tomorrow to Friday of next week. I won't make it due at class time next week. We'll just have the whole week to work on it. Um, and just make sure you get that last forum post in <clears throat> by May 1st next week. Cool. All right. So if you're scheduling stuff out. Secondly, um, what are we doing? I asked you guys um, the other day to think about it for today. What are we doing? Um, like I said, this is a Soviet style democracy question. What are we doing with quiz four in the exam? What's happening? Um, I guess we could. I could take an informal vote here um, or maybe just some nods. Uh, what I saw the other day is that we were all kind of maybe leaning towards uh, taking some material from quiz four and smushing it into the final exam and sort of doing away with quiz four. Okay, good. Okay, yeah. Is that generally acknowledged? Instead of taking a quiz next week and forum post and then taking a final exam, what you'll have left in here is last forum post next week. And that's kind of it for next week. And then during exam week, you'll have final exam and final paper to turn in. Are we cool with that? Okay, good. So then that's what we'll do, okay? And, and I'll formalize that in a post and in a page that I'll put on Canvas. But uh, for your planning purposes to write down and to have here on our um, Zoom session, uh, the uh, three major things left uh, in this course to complete uh, are going to be uh, your final forum post next week, the final exam during exam week, and the uh, final draft, the uh, uh, paper, the historiographer, a historiographic paper on um, your topic of your choice. Okay, so that's what's going on in here. Um, so you guys are clear on uh, stuff that's done uh, in here. John, you got a question? No, I was just stretching. Oh, okay. All right. Usually, when students go like this, they they that means they got a question, but that's all right. <laughs> ah, this might suck you, man. All right. Those are the announcements. Cool. All right. Awesome. Um, great. Uh, anybody else got anything uh, comment wise, question wise, before we get into just a little bit of material today? Uh, yes, no, maybe so. Okay. Awesome. Then on we go. Um, one of the cool things I want to talk about um, is the back end of the notes that we were looking at and that I posted yesterday, which is um, 
that Latin phrase towards the end of the notes where it says all things, you know, things, some things never change. Remember me talking about that um, in our notes that, that some things never change. Um, it's that Latin phrase that we talked about at the end uh, there. So one of the things I want to, I want to do today is try and find instances of that within those three primary sources that I gave you um, from the Fordham uh, source book. All right. Um, so if you have thoughts on any of these, um, you know, type them into the chat or, or, or uh, raise your hand and stretch and I'll call on you. Um, and you can ask uh, or, or talk about some of the cool things you found in them. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I found that hopefully you can pick up on. Uh, but if you want to talk about some of the things you found in them, go, go right ahead. Kansas, awesome. Okay, uh, he said many of the so-called students resorted to the university simply for enjoyment with no idea of study. That's from uh, the life of students. Um, I really like that. Uh, that document, right? That's the one that you, you're, you're picking up on the, uh, the, the life of the students. Miles chime in here. Love the idea of challenging the professor to become a master. Yes, indeed. Um, it, it, we'll talk about um, that aspect of it. One of those things uh, is uh, talked about in the statutes for the University of Paris. Um, yeah, let's get um, one of the cool things that uh, if I can share the screen here, maybe we can uh, pick up on uh, one of those uh, aspects or a few of those aspects you guys um, are getting into and talking about here. And again, um, if uh, the, uh, when I share my screen, if the volume kind of gets a little squirrely, um, give me a thumbs down and uh, <clears throat> I'll try and reform it. Uh, but we're looking at some things here. Uh, first one I want to look at, can you guys see this screen at all? Yes, no, maybe so. Not yet. Not yet. All right, it's coming. Hopefully you'll be able to see the, uh, the screen here in a bit. When you do see the screen, somebody give me a thumbs up when you see the screen. Um, it's weird how sometimes these things work uh, lickety split and sometimes they don't. Here it is. Yes? All right. Let's start just because this is the one that, um, uh, that, that popped up here, Life of uh, the Students in Paris. Um, truly an interesting document, uh, without a doubt. Because what this document gets into is talking about how um, this testimony is a kind of a unanimous um, look into this guy's sort of um, not enjoying the students on campus, uh, that the students are, are raucous and they are you know evil and conflicts are erupting between the different nations and i talked about that at the end of our notes yesterday is how students would be housed uh via their nationality um and i, I found that uh, entirely interesting and this one does some other um cool things uh as well as it talks about how town versus gown disputes here up, up top it says town versus gown rows were frequent all right um that guys can be uh that's one of those very interesting things that uh, I want you to pick up on um, that the disputes between um, the townies versus the students because they were seen as uh, sometimes the students in the universities were seen as being above the law uh, that everyone else had to had to live under. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit more of that when we get to the statutes uh, for the University of Paris, um, especially with that one. Um, but this one, the life of the students of Paris, um, did anybody find anything interesting here other than um, looking into, uh, you know, how they was talking about students aren't, you know, Kansi brought up students aren't interested in knowledge. They're, they're kind of there for their own edification. They're, they're just sort of there to party. Just, I mean, how, how uh, modern is that? Like, oh, you know, students are just there to party and, you know, the, and you get a little education on the side. Um, this thing is talking about that. This document, you know, is coming all the way back to us from the 1200s. Um, I like this part right here, where it basically describes our tribe. Um, from the, from the of Not just him in my nose, just a giant smiley face. That because the you know the, the inward drunkards, uh, the germs furious and obscene the feast. <laughs> um, the Romans were seditious and turbulent and slanderous, and the Sicilians were tyrannical. Blah, blah, blah. Just, you know, still describing the students as as sort of anything but fair for cool. I'm alive. I want to pop over to uh, the statues for the University of Paris uh, for every ninth. Uh, I want to look at here real quick. 
for the reason, I want to highlight at the top that there were two main actors of university organizations that developed time here, right? Uh, I think which employed teachers. You don't need to model employed teachers. Not one, do you guys think, I'm going to pop share real quick. Which one do you guys think uh, is kind of the one that, that's still, um, that, that we employ today? Do you think we employ the Italian version in which the students employ the teachers, or do we employ the Northern European model in which the teachers dominated? What do you guys think? Yeah, John, I, I, I totally agree. Let's, you know, uh, you, you put the Northern, why, why do you say that, John, the, the Northern one? Because, I mean, the students know, like in our institutions in America, the students don't employ the teachers. The teachers are employed by the institutions of which they represent. I think, without a doubt, um, the feeling is that uh, we still employ the, the Northern model, you know, where the teacher is technically um, in charge uh, and the student is seen as uh, apprentice uh, to the situation. Um, you know, while there are variations, uh, you know, and I have had students in the past, um, you know, tell me like, you know, my tuition pays your salary and, and all this stuff. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I think to a degree, um, to a degree certainly, um, but there's other uh, instances of that um, that we can talk about. I asked you guys um, towards the end of that uh, note, going through the notes yesterday, um, about what you think, uh, why, the type of student that was in the universities. Remember that question towards the end of the notes I asked you, um, why, is, why are the majority of students, the vast majority of students from lower nobility and from the merchant class? I remember talking about that at all. Anybody have any thoughts on why, why the vast number of students were from just one or two particular classes? Um, and so what I'm guessing, what, if you're having trouble with that question, I guess I can um, phrase it a different way. Um, I'm going to type it into our chat. And so um, if your book states education was open to every male, but my question then, maybe if we want to rephrase it, is where is the upper nobility and the lower working classes? If the only people that are, if the vast majority of people that are in these universities are mainly lower nobility, kind of upper middle class and the merchants middle class, where's the upper nobility and the lower working classes? What are they doing? The upper nobility, they were being privately tutored, right? And the, and the, lower, and the lower working classes couldn't really afford the education, yeah. uh, the materials and everything, so. Yeah, that's great, Ethan. Um, well done. If you were of upper nobility class, if you were, um, you know, in that, really high echelon. You're not going to go to a university. You're going to, you're going to do the Alexander the Great thing and you're going to, and you're just going to go grab Plato and Aristotle and you're going to bring them out to you. All right. And, and you're going to, you're going to, you sit here and educate me. All right. Uh, because I am the upper crust. Uh, that, that's a great point. So you're going to hire the upper nobility. You're going to hire those, uh, the, the, the professors to you. Now, that's the thing guys is one of the things that the book doesn't talk about is that uh, this became a very profitable profession for like the upper elite echelon of professors, you would um, kind of go out like a free agent in essence, all right? Um, that you're like, like the big, big jobs wouldn't necessarily be the big paying jobs wouldn't be at the universities. Like you would sort of free, like, like a free agent, you would kind of pitch yourself to these really rich upper nobility and you would say, hey, hey um, I, you want me to come and educate your children? Uh, you know, uh, I'm the one that you want to employ here. Those were the, the really high paying jobs. Um, you know, and so there was, there were these, um, and you probably read about this in chapter 11, that, you know, uh, and we'll get into a chapter 14, guys like Peter Abelard were known as like traveling scholars. And they would travel around all of Europe and kind of go to the highest bidder. All right. Um, we still do that in modern education. We still have visiting professors and traveling professors. Now we don't necessarily do it a lot of Thomas More because we're not an institution that has a lot of disposable income to be hiring visiting professors. But at places like UC and Xavier, um, I remember all the time, uh, you know, during grad school, you know, you would be like, ooh, we're getting, uh, you know, such and such is coming in from England for a semester and he's gonna be teaching this kind of side class and everybody be going crazy, you know, because it'd be, you know, that's a great professor that would, come, that would be coming in. And so people can still do that. You can still kind of free agent uh, yourself out there uh, depending on um, whether you're marketable or not. 
And Ethan, I think you're right uh, as well. The lower class, as, as your book talks about, um, to support, page 345, to support a young man from age 15 to his early 20s, during the height of his youthful strength and energy, when those qualities were sorely needed in the fields or the shop, was more than most lower income families could afford, page 345. I think that's a big point. Um, and it's still one of those things uh, that was with us well up into the modern uh, world here in even the United States, that even up until very recently, um, and I'm talking into well into the 1900s, uh, especially in rural areas, you would say, um, you know, I, why am I going to send my, you know, my three strapping sons off to college when I need them on the farm? I need their, I need that labor. Uh, and they need to be learning how to, to farm and not going off uh, to college to party uh, and, and not do anything. Okay, so, so there's still some, some aspects of that uh, at work. Uh, and also, guys, I think there's also an element to uh, this kind of burgeoning, bubbling situation that is happening in the modern world. Um, I don't want to say it's anti-intellectual, but it's th th this thing where you're getting a lot of pushback from, from a lot of people that are like, you know, what is the value of a college education? Should I just um, advise my son or daughter when they're 18 to just, you know, uh, apprentice uh, at a construction site and, and work their way up in construction or apprentice at a, um, as a mechanic and then become kind of a master mechanic and learn how to fix people's cars uh, and not, you know, spend that money on, on a degree or education. I think there's still elements of that uh, alive today. Does that make sense to you guys at all? Yeah, cool. Um, if I can come back and share uh, uh, the, the bottom part of that, uh, Gregory, uh, the ninth university statutes uh, for Paris, um, I want to share kind of the bottom part of that document, uh, if you guys had that with you, um, where they begin to discuss more of these town versus gown disputes. One of the cool things that you guys can find is when you do find in the primary sources things that we're talking about. Uh, it's always one of my favorite things um, to, uh, to see. Can you guys see um, this document yet? Thumb up, thumb down, yes? Yes. Okay. Cool, thank you very much. I'm going to highlight uh, the part that I want to talk about here, um, where this statute, remember guys, these are statutes given by the Pope uh, for the university. So again, the church is exerting their power, their force onto the university. And so this is coming from the Pope. This is, you know, as it says at the bottom, given on the 13th of April in the fifth year of the pontificate of Gregory the Ninth. So th th these are statutes. The Pope is exerting his authority uh, and saying, these are gonna be the statutes of the University of Paris. Guys, this is very similar to what we have today with where the, uh, Thomas More University has, we have a board of trustees, we have a president in President Chilo, but who really runs Thomas More University? You guys know like who is the chancellor? Who is, if he says it, it happens. And it's not the president. You have anything I know? You can grab uh, a couple, couple, couple chats. On Stop. Uh, the bishop. Yes. No, Miles. Not Patrick Egan. That's funny. <laughs> I wish it was me. But you're right, Kenzie. The bishop. The bishop is the chancellor. All right. What the bishop says goes uh, on on uh, on campus. You guys, uh, am I frozen? I feel like I'm frozen. Am I back? Am I back to being unfrozen? Good, good. Um, so let's go back and, and look at that uh, document one, one last time as they begin to talk about those town versus gown disputes. As it says at the bottom there, they're talking about summer vacation. And it says, moreover, we prohibit more expressly the students from carrying weapons in the city and the university for protecting those who disturb the peace and study. I like that a lot. So it's basically saying, you know, you can't be just walking around, uh, you know, uh, in downtown Paris armed, okay? Uh, because nobody else is allowed to, all right? Uh, and so the students aren't going to be allowed to as well, all right? So those are those things is uh, you're going to see like some laws and rules are going to be different for campus and town. So on campus, guys, at the University of Paris, you were allowed to carry arms. You were allowed to walk around with a knife or a sword, 
Okay, and you're not gonna have, obviously you're not gonna have a gun during this time period because it's before the invention of those things. But the people of Paris were not allowed to walk around armed with any type of, of uh, you know, uh, object, knife, sword, whatever. And so sometimes the students would feel, well, uh, when they're walking around downtown Paris, I'm a student, I can do whatever I want. Basically what the Pope is saying here is, no, you can't. You are not allowed to essentially violate the laws of the city in which the university is in. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, they might pick up anything from the, from the last document, the, uh, the, the statutes for the University uh, of Paris. Um, that's the one from 1215. Anybody find anything cool from that one at all? Yeah, in the upper chat, I put a comment. Uh, I was talking about uh, a quote from it that they were talking about also the masters and students can make uh, among themselves or with others agreements and regulations. Yeah. And I said, like a, a syllabus, like a contract between the teachers and the students. Excellent. So. That's a great one. Um, th this one here, and I'll highlight it, is talking about, uh, Ethan, what you're kind of getting into there, which is, um, where it says no one is to lecture at the University of Paris before he's 20 years old, all right? Um, you have to listen, you have to listen, basically, you have to be a student for six years before you're allowed to lecture, uh, is what it's saying here. Um, and it goes into all kinds of other things, like um, you must not be besmirched by infamy, uh, meaning you can't, you can't have like, uh, you know, you, you can't have gone out and broken the law, or you can't be a person of ill repute and be a professor, all right? Um, that holds, guys, that holds today in, in, in the modern world, all right? Um, even though, like, like, for instance, the professor at Thomas More, um, we're, we're, you know, if we do something in our life outside of the campus that reflects poorly on uh, ourselves or Thomas More, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to be a professor anymore. Uh, so, so even what that's saying is, and like I said, modern instances of that, is um, it's not just stuff that you do on campus, it's stuff that you do off campus that can also reflect uh, how you're going to be viewed and how you're going to be hired and those types of things. Um, if we can skip down a little bit on that document, I found some other interesting things um, where it starts talking about um, on certain feast days, th this part of the document here. Um, this guy's, this is the church exercising its authority again, all right? Remember, if you, if you want to read through this with me real quick, basically what it's saying is, is on feast days, about 100 of these a year, you're only allowed to read from the seven liberal arts. And it's specifically, one of the cool things, it stands. Certain books are you know, those are some fixed and natural philosophy are not be read and abandon some other things, too, all right? So that's really cool if you're picking up on that. Is the church is still trying to exert kind of old school authority where it's like, in certain things you're not allowed to read the of, uh, of pagans, you know, the, uh, the books of the pagan world, the Romans and the Greeks, I like that one a lot. Um, what, anybody think anything from this document? Um, I have mine up there here. Um, I'm going to highlight. And uh, maybe you guys can be on one of the reasons I like this is because I'm a contract. Um, and I'm going to write the notes. I'm going to write the notes. I'm going to write the notes. I'm going to write Confirm the or of following matter. It's been killed. It's been killed. Injury. Justice is not done. Basically, what it says is students and master are kind of doing justice. On the money. I'm just pulling myself out of the now, too, because, um, you know, and I'll stop sharing there for a minute. Um, things, guys, things don't get put into, um, things don't get put into contracts um, just kind of pell mell or willy nilly. That, that thing's in there for a reason. And um, it's not in there just by one happenstance occurrence. So what it's saying is, is that, is that students probably were getting beat up by townies. They were, when they would go into town, they were, you know, obviously being harassed and hurt in some occasions, sometimes killed and mutilated. And so what you could do is you could basically take up a collection amongst the rest of your students and your teacher and sort of go out and avenge uh, that, that situation. Um, I really like that uh, instance there in that, in that, in that uh, statute because that statute is basically a contract. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. For the last couple of minutes before we take a break, I just want to hit on uh, some things that we're going to, we want to look at and get into over the weekend. Okay. Um, so the big thing guys that we want to, and I'll type it in here to uh, our chat. The big thing we want to get into this weekend is, is we're looking at chapter 14. Okay. And within chapter 14, um, you've got to make sure that you've got this definition of scholasticism down. Okay. That if, imagine like we do in, in our course a lot, if somebody comes up to you and says, Hey, I don't know anything about scholasticism. What can you tell me? Um, that sounds like a very 
professor exe type question on a future exam, does it not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, imagine someone coming up to you and saying, uh, you know, I don't know anything about scholasticism, what can you tell me? Um, could you talk to them for a little bit about some of the major W's, some of the major who's and what's and, and, and where's and, and, uh, and when's of scholasticism? Hopefully you could. Um, and after you read that chapter, um, you're going to hopefully bring up people like St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and you're going to bring up guys like St. Anselm of Canterbury and people that we're going to learn about uh, over the weekend and through chapter 14. Um, the big thing, guys, with scholasticism, okay, is, uh, is there's these great definitions of it on uh, pages 4, 22, and 23, okay? Um, pages 4, 22, and pages 4, 23 really provide some awesome definitions that you can start to work with. And basically what it talks about on 4.22 is scholasticism confidently asserted its ability to provide rational proofs and explanations for literally every tenant of the Christian faith. Right, so like I talked about yesterday, scholastics in this kind of Aristotelian way believe that everything happens for a reason and every idea, fact, and occurrence has a place in the ordering in the structure, okay? So according to, to the scholastic, nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens in our world by happenstance or by coincidence. Everything is part of a larger structure. It's the essence of our whole, whole course that we've been looking at, guys, is that the medieval world believes that everything is part of an overarching unified whole. And the scholastics are the culmination of it. The scholastics try to put it in writing, okay? It's one thing to say that you believe everything is connected. Anybody can say that. Can you prove it? Can you prove it in writing? And I talked about that in the notes yesterday. If you, if you watched it, it's kind of like those geometry proofs. Did we all, I didn't get to see any of your faces. Do you guys remember doing those in high school or maybe in college? Yeah, I know you're kind of, I'm, I, every time I think about them, I kind of have like Vietnam flashbacks, you know, where it's just, where it's like, ooh, you know, like that. And it's, it's those things where it's like, I remember sitting there in class and I'm like, I know that the two lines are equal because I just measured them. And that's not enough. That's not enough. Uh, you got to go through the steps. All right. Uh, and then at the end, the point of going through the steps is, is that nobody can challenge you. Nobody can, nobody can hit on any of your points because you proved everything out perfectly. Um, and that's scholasticism. Okay. Um, one of the cool things that I want you to pick up on is you're going to read about this guy, uh, Aquinas, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. And with, throughout the book, you're going to read, um, throughout the chapter, you're going to read one of, the, one of the cool things that I want you to pick up on this weekend is he writes a, a, a book. He writes a book called The Summa Contra Gentiles. Okay, it's in Latin. And basically what that means in Latin is a, an accumulation of everything that you need to counter non-Christians. All right. So basically what it is, is, is Thomas Aquinas believes, this is the thing also with, with, with scholastics, guys, they're really arrogant. They're really arrogant, and they think that they can outthink you and prove everything under the sun. Okay, so it's, it's also this arrogance of scholasticism that the people of the Renaissance start totally reacting against. All right, it's, it's one of the major things that the Renaissance reacts against is this kind of staunchy kind of conservatism of the scholastic. All right, and one of the things that Aquinas writes, he goes, I'm basically going to write a handbook. So if you confront a Jewish person or a Muslim or anybody that's not Latin Christian, you can immediately consult my summa here and be like, aha, nope, you're wrong. Here is where it's proven that Christianity is correct. Uh, and it, it's just one of those interesting little uh, tidbits from scholasticism that you would think that you could carry around this little handbook. And, and when you got into a theological argument with someone, you would be like, haha, nope, Aquinas says here, uh, this is right, I'm in, all right? Uh, and it's uh, a really interesting little situation you got going on. Um, so the big thing is, um, if we could pick up on these things from the weekend, all right, uh, and get ready for uh, putting together the forum post, which will be a couple of things that we'll uh, look at uh, and view over the weekend, we should be good to go. Everybody cool on that? Awesome. All right. So get through, uh, get into chapter 14 this weekend. Um, I'll publish a uh, forum post, uh, last one uh, here on uh, the next 24 hours or so. And then we'll be off and rolling into our last week, guys. Anybody got anything towards the end? Comments, questions? No? All right. All right. Talkative as always.
<laughs> I'm kidding. Well, it was, I, I thought we, it was it was really good there. I thought we got a lot of good comments out in the chat and on the uh, uh, in, in our discussion. It was good stuff. All right, guys. So if you got anything, uh, don't hesitate to uh, canvas message me uh, or send it along. Uh, and uh, until then, I guess um, I'll see you on Tuesday. Have a great weekend. Be safe. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Yeah.